Greetings, my name is Sam Powers. I want to welcome you to our online worship for First United Methodist Church of Edmond. We're delighted to have you join us today, and we would invite you to check in in some way so we can uh, reach, have a broader reach to a broader audience. So if you'd like or comment or share the feed, we really appreciate it. It helps us to connect with one another while we're worshiping together as the online body of Christ. I did want to say that we are doing things a little bit differently starting next week. Uh, what we're doing now is pre-recording our services, and that's what you've seen. Next week, we're going to be going to a live stream, and that'll be happening at 8.30 and 11 o'clock. And so the camera angles you'll see a little bit different, and uh, some of the mistakes that I make will not be edited out. And so, But it'll be a live congregation that you'll see with us, worshiping with us. So it'll give a little bit different kind of experience, and I hope you'll continue to join us. At this time, let us worship together.
Will you please join me in today's call to worship? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And now join us for our opening hymn, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. Let us join together in our congregational prayer. Almighty God, in whom we live and move and have our being, you have made us for yourself so that our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Grant us purity of heart and strength of purpose that no selfish passion may hinder us from knowing your will, no weakness from doing it, but that in your light we may see light and in your service find perfect freedom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Let us pray. God, from whom every gift derives, we gather here to worship you today. We've come to you in thanksgiving and praise to know what you are, God, and to place our lives anew into your perspective. Enlarge our vision with your word. Hold up before us the vision of your kingdom, a kingdom of justice and mercy, truth and compassion. Help us to grasp the meaning of the gospel which you have entrusted to us and give us grace to live by it. We pray for our church and seek God's guidance and help and the task to which we are called. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our services of worship may be worthy offering to you and may attract, include, and inspire people of all ages, that our inner life of prayer and our attention to Scripture may be nurtured, and that the journey of faith may not be seen as only for the few, that children and young people may be listened to, encouraged, and challenged to become committed Christians, that our church premises may convey a message of openness, be a means of Christian service, and forge effective links with our local community. That we may be reaching out to those on the fringes of faith or outside it and be proactive in meeting social and community needs. That we may continue to develop imaginative strategies for involvement in world mission and justice issues. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let us pray as Jesus taught us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're continuing in the lectionary this morning with 1 John 3, 16 through 24, and I would invite you to attend to this good word. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word, which both comforts and challenges us, and we appreciate the love we receive in our lives. Help us to show it to others on a more consistent basis and help our meditations on this passage move us in this direction. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, on August 16th, 1987, Northwest Airlines Flight 225 crashed just after taking off from the Detroit airport, killing 155 people and leaving just one survivor, a four-year-old from Tempe, Arizona, named Cecilia. News accounts say that when rescuers found Cecilia, they did not believe she had been on the plane. Investigators first assumed she'd been a passenger in one of the cars on the highway onto which the plane crashed but they soon discovered that she was indeed a passenger on this downed airliner. They believed that Cecilia survived because even as the plane was falling, Cecilia's mother Paula unbuckled her own seatbelt, got down on her knees in front of her daughter, wrapped her arms around Cecilia, and would not let her go. Cecilia has become a mark of resurrection in this life. She should be dead if not for the love of her mother who saved her life. And as I speak about marks of resurrection, I'm reminded of John's gospel where Thomas doubts the resurrection of Jesus because he was absent when the other disciples first saw the risen Lord. Thomas states specifically, unless I see the mark of the nails and the place where his side was pierced, I won't believe. He wanted to see these marks and even touch them in order to come to belief in the resurrection. While there has been some debate on whether the resurrection appearances were physical or just visual in nature, this story led the early church to land on a physical appearance as Jesus has Thomas touch the healed over scars. These are marks of resurrection. They show us that Jesus did indeed suffer. It wasn't all a dream. We didn't just imagine it, and he didn't either. It was painful for him, and he died. Some early sects of Christianity didn't think that Jesus actually suffered. They didn't believe that his body was physical. They were called docetists, and this was from the Greek word meaning to seem. So according to them, Jesus only appeared to suffer on the cross. It was all really an illusion. This was declared heresy as it takes away from the real significance of the incarnation. It begs the question, well, did God walk as a human being or not? Have you ever had someone doubt your own experience of trauma? Ever had anyone downplay it? (laughs) How did that make you feel? Some people are always going to outdo you. You broke your leg? Well, they broke both of their legs. (laughs) Your parents got divorced? Theirs got divorced, remarried, and then got divorced again and at a more tender age than you. (laughs) You miss work for a week with the flu? They were hospitalized and almost died. (laughs) If someone minimizes your own suffering, they are in a way denying your reality and dismissing you. And this is what Christianity ultimately decided that the docetists did with Jesus. They denied the reality of his suffering. Sometimes we may do this because it is difficult to confront the reality of pain and trauma. We may actually do this because we are tenderhearted and we don't want anybody to go through agony. And so if someone is depressed... Sometimes the depressed person may hear responses like, well, it's all in your head, or no one ever said life was fair, or you should get out more. While we may have good intentions, these can be dismissive statements that minimize the suffering of another, even if they're intended for good. And the depressed individual is less likely to come to you for help in the future. And so our scripture reminds us that Jesus laid down his life for us, He actually suffered and died. And as his followers, we seek to lay down our lives for others. And while we may not have the opportunity to physically die for someone else, like the mother of four-year-old Cecilia, there are places where we can make sacrifices for the good of someone else. John and Mary Ellen Patterson had four children. Two of the children, John Jr. and Laura, were perfectly healthy. The other two children, Elizabeth and Will, were born with a genetic disorder known as cystinosis, which often leads to loss of kidney function. At 16, Elizabeth suffered kidney failure and underwent a successful transplant from an anonymous deceased donor. Her father, John, had wanted to donate a kidney, but testing ruled him out. A short time later, the father, John, died suddenly from a massive heart attack. John Jr., 15 at the time, felt a new responsibility take shape in his life. 
as he watched Will go through dialysis and having seen the great struggle his sister went through, John thought to himself, if I can change this in any way possible, I will. When John Jr. turned 18, his opportunity came. He was tested to see if he was a transplant match for his brother Will, and he was. And so John Jr. told his mother at the time, I watched you take care of Elizabeth and Will my whole life, and I always wanted to do something, and now's my chance. Well, the surgery was a success, and after receiving his brother's kidney, Will earned a 4.0 grade point average for his second semester, despite having to play catch-up the whole year. He spends his days engaged in carefree fun with his friends. Let's call it what it is, Mary Ellen says of John Jr.'s decision. It was a huge sacrifice that gave his brother his life back. And I think John's life will be better because of the gift he gave. John Jr. likely had a nice scar from where he donated his kidney to his brother Will. And one could look at it today and see it as a mark of resurrection. His gift allowed life for another. And so this impacted at least two lives significantly, his brother Will and his own. Wouldn't this change you for the better if you had the sure knowledge that you saved someone's life? Okay, so you may not be willing to give a kidney to somebody, (laughs) but what if we just saw one another? What if the love we had for others was being willing to see them? In the September-October 2007 issue of Today's Christian, Shirley Shaw tells the story of how the sacrifices of a successful cabinet maker named Terry Lane continue to change a drug-riddled neighborhood in Jacksonville, Florida. Lane states, My business had prospered to the point my 40-man staff needed more space to produce the quality cabinets for which Mid Lane was well known. And so we found an ideal location in northwest Jacksonville and in 1985 built a 25,000 square foot state-of-the-art plant that was soon humming with activity. Life was good, but my peace and comfort were short-lived. Almost immediately, problems erupted. Every night the burglar alarm sounded and I was summoned to the plant by police officers. Broken windows, shots fired, bullet holes in the walls, stolen equipment, vandalism, even incinerated cars in the parking lot. So one night an officer asked me, what possessed you to build a plant this close to the rock? (laughs) What do you mean the rock, I ask? The Cleveland Arms Apartments, he responded. More crack cocaine is sold here than anywhere in Jacksonville. So we call it the rock. And he proceeded to enlighten me about my new neighborhood. The 200-unit subsidized housing complex was occupied by drug dealers, prostitutes, and felons, a place considered so dangerous police were hesitant to go there. Well, as I sat mulling over the situation from out of nowhere, a thought so clear it was almost audible. If you'll love those who despitefully use you, I'll take care of it. Stunned and shaken by God's admonition, I wondered how I'd obey this gentle command. Then I sensed him say, forget all about the shooting and all the garbage. Look at the children. Well, days went by as I prayed for my neighbors and tried to figure out how to connect with this community. So I bought several basketballs, wrote Jesus loves you and Mr. Lane loves you on them and threw them over the fence into the complex. There's no immediate reaction, but at least they didn't throw them back. (laughs) Then one Saturday, while I was working alone, I stepped outside for a break. I heard the noise of children playing beneath a tractor trailer parked on our property. When they saw me, one of them said, there's the man, and they all started running. Wait, I called. Would you like something to drink? Four or five little kids followed me into the plant where I opened the soft drink machine and gave them a cold soda pop. Well, they went home, and I didn't think any more about it. And then on Monday afternoon, I heard a commotion in the lobby. And I went and I saw the receptionist say, can I help you? (laughs) As I walked down the hallway, I heard one little kid ask, where's the big man with the beard? And turning the corner, I saw 16 kids in the lobby looking for me. Well, they're looking for the man with the key to the drink machine. And this was the beginning. Suddenly, 35 children adopted me coming to my office every day after school instead of going home. There was really nothing for them to go home to. And so day after day, I worked at my drafting table 
while I was surrounded by kids on the floor, busily coloring or doing other crafts that I had brought. Thus began the journey that would change my world and that of many kids whose addicted parents left them to fend for themselves. Lane writes that years flew by and the kids I mentored became a part of my life. Can you see the marks of resurrection? Maybe these marks are a cabinet-making plant plunked down next to a housing project. Maybe these marks are the willingness of Terry Lane to see children who need love rather than see them as vandals who want to tear up his property. You may not be ready to mentor 35 kids from the inner city, but what about asking yourselves to look at others differently? What if the marks of resurrection in your life are the places where you have suffered and instead of making you hard, they make you compassionate and willing to help someone else who may go, be going through something similar today? No matter what you think, you didn't get through your problems on your own. When we think that way, we don't see resurrection as much as self-resilience. Maybe the marks of resurrection for us are the harsh words that sometimes people return for our kindness. Maybe as we continue to reach out, because that's who we are in Christ, we find that our words of care soften someone else's scars from where they've been wounded. If we are consistent in our loving action, it won't just seem that Christians care. It will be a reality. And our words become marks of resurrection for a world that could use a little kindness. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another just as he has commanded us. May it be so for us today. Amen. Would you join me in this morning's prayer of confession? Beloved God, we fear your judgment. Teach us to know it as our friend. Your word has pierced us to the bone. We are exposed, laid open to your sight. Therefore, let us bless you, for you have come to us when we are most ashamed, and when we long to hide our face from you. You will not suffer us to turn away. You call us by our name. You touch us, raise us, invite us into shameless love. God who loves us, we ask you to know us, judge us, turn us, wound us, demand of us, forgive us. We are yours. We abandon ourselves to your love. We trust you. Let us pray now in silence for the forgiveness of sin. First John 3:14 reminds us, "Whoever does not love abides in death. May your faith in Christ allow you to cast off the world of death and embrace the world of love." Would you join me now in our affirmation of faith? Let love be genuine and live in harmony. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Outdo one another in showing honor. Be humble and never conceited. Love is stronger than death, and jealousy is cruel as the grave. Floods cannot drown love, and wealth cannot buy it. Put love above all else. Let Christ's peace rule your hearts. Always be forgiving, as Christ has forgiven you. Love is not jealous or boastful, arrogant, rude, or stubborn, irritable, resentful, or possessive. Love is patient and kind. Do not love in word or speech only. Love also in deed and truth. Receive each other in sincerity, find mercy, and grow old together. Love rejoices in the right. It bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things, for love is faithful and endless. When the Lord builds the house, the labor is never in vain. Happy are those who take refuge in God. Those who serve the Lord are redeemed. As we approach the giving moment, you may give by texting, sending a check to the church, or by giving online. Let us pray. 
Glorious God, we know that your capacity to love is infinitely greater than our own ability. Indeed, you call us to love one another in truth and in action. We yearn to be active disciples so that our hearts truly abide with you. Use these gifts to increase our ability to be your followers. In the name of the one who laid down his life for us, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.
Before we sing our closing hymn, if you would like to know more about our church or have an interest in joining our church, I invite you to email me at sam at fumcedmond.org. And now let us sing together our closing hymn, Lead On, O King Eternal. And now I invite you to receive the benediction. As we go forward, may we go in the love of God. May we go with the understanding that Jesus Christ leads us along our way. May we go that the Holy Spirit would invite us into relationship with one another. May you go in this good peace today. Amen.
Hi, <laughs> welcome. Uh, I'm Sam Powers, and, and this is Ethan Cooper, and this is our last end scene. We started producing these uh, during the pandemic because I thought they would be funny. It'd be a funny way for us to relax and have something to laugh at while everything else is just kind of anxious for us. And so while we've done these, Ethan has done a great job in directing them and doing all the cuts of the video and, and really helping us uh, make them funny. And so, Ethan, do you want to say anything about what goes into those? Oh, um, nothing too difficult. I mean, you were the one who wrote them all, and then I would just uh, film, you know, kind of like I would make like high, like what I would do in high school with my friends and stuff. So it was fun to do it again. All right. Well, he's being modest. He really did put a lot into it, and we appreciate that. Uh, Ethan has gone on to Tulsa. He's moved to Tulsa, and he's doing business there. He's, he's working as a video producer, and so, Ethan, we wish you the best. Thank you. And thank you very much for being there for us during our time of need. We appreciate it. And so, uh, Marshmallow. Oh. Your collar's flipped. You need to fix that. Oh. Good call.